funny ways men show they like you without saying it, okay? Um, so we'll get into that in a moment. However, I want to address the elephant in the room, and that is the is the the reason why men can't like you, the reason why a woman can't like a man, the reason why relationships oftentimes struggle. And that elephant in the room is the walls people are carrying, the armor people are carrying, the assorted ways humans block love, the assorted ways humans block their capacity to like another person. And I'm speaking from personal experience because my demographic is midlife predominantly, which is after baby making years before retirement. So roughly most of the people that come to me are between the age of 42 and 69. That's not an absolute number. But what's unique about this demographic is that a significant percentage of people in midlife are divorced. Roughly, anecdotally speaking, 75% of people who are in the dating marketplace over 40 are most likely divorced. Well, why is this so important to, um, to address? Because when you unravel the tapestry of a life with someone else, it's important to heal from that past relationship. Now, I'm speaking from personal experience because I actually went through my, uh, a divorce 20 years ago. It's hard to believe this year is the 20th year that my ex, my ex, now ex-wife and I uh, split up. And I will tell you, I was immediately on the dating apps, literally the moment I moved out of the house. In fact, it took two years for our divorce to become final. But throughout that time, I was actively in the dating marketplace. Why was I in the dating marketplace? Because I had a hole inside of me that needed to be filled. I need someone to complete me. So I was in that demographic of folks that was rather wounded after their marriage, thinking that all I needed was somebody to love me so I could feel good about myself. Yeah, let me repeat that. I needed someone to love me so I could feel good about myself. And I went from person to person to person to person. And I recognized that during that period of time, I had a major chip on my shoulder. However, it was on a subconscious level. You see, cognitively speaking, I thought all I needed was someone else in my life so I could move on from this relationship, this marriage, if you will. And so I went from one person to the next to the next. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever been with a man who's probably been from one person to the next to the next? Did you find yourself in that same space of going from one person to the next to the next? It could be one or two dates, could be a short-lived experience. You see, for many people, after a significant breakup, they put walls up. And these walls are defense mechanisms to avoid pain. That's right, avoid pain. We put on this armor, we put up these walls because we don't want to hurt again. And our coping mechanisms can be a variety of different things. For me, drugs and alcohol was a primary coping mechanism for me. Not only was I going through a divorce, my high-end corporate job decided to lay me off, and then there was the market crash of 2008 where I got financially wiped out. I, the ground underneath me wasn't solid. I was an absolute train wreck for over a half a dozen years. And then I met a woman who accepted me, but yet still, I was a train wreck. And to her credit, she accepted me, she loved me, but I wasn't in a good place to be in a relationship. Why am I bringing this up? Because I think it's really important to address the big gigantic elephant in the room. And when I, if you've heard, watched any of my videos in the past, I continually talk about childhood wounds and adult traumas. Childhood wounds and adult traumas. One of the most significant adult trauma is the ending of a relationship. Now, for most people that go through a divorce, they've probably been married for quite a bit of time. They fell out of love with the person they're with. And so there might be some um, anger, some attitude, even some hatred, even some disgust for the other person. I'm sure you felt might have felt that way about someone you're in relationship with. 
And oftentimes our coping mechanism is to put ourselves out there in the dating marketplace. But the problem is, if there's a wall up, if there's armor, if there's any residue from the past, it will affect any future relationship. I know in particular a man who went through a nasty divorce financially. He felt he got raked through over the coals. And it turns out that he had a daughter and a son, well, roughly, let's just say, between the ages of 16 and 14 at the time of the divorce. And it turned out his daughter ended up becoming his primary emotional support person, his primary emotional support person. He went on to meet a woman and fall in love with her, but it turns out that his daughter took precedent to this woman. The daughter was his primary emotional support person. That's how he coped with the ending of a relationship. And so the woman he was with, he treated in second place, always in second place. Even though he cared for this woman and he loved this woman, he always put his daughter above her. And eventually he ended the relationship. He ended the relationship because he put his daughter ahead. Now, the sad part in this story is this devastated this woman. It absolutely emotionally devastated her. She literally was on the brink of a nervous breakdown over the ending of this relationship, even though throughout the entire time she knew she was in second place. And what did she do? She put walls up in her future relationships. She was unable to completely open up because of the hurt she experienced. Why am I bringing this up? I said this earlier. I want you to look deep into your own life. Do you have walls up? Do you have residue? Does it make it, is it hard for you to open up to a new person? I'd be shocked if you said no, because I know from my own personal experience, I went through this divorce and I barely began healing. Even in, it's interestingly enough, the second, the first person that major relationship after I had with my, excuse me, the first major relationship I had after my divorce was with a therapist. In fact, Actually, I got constant therapy in this relationship to really peel the onion of a lot of layers of emotional pain I was experiencing, not just in the divorce, but also the, you know, the losing my money in the market crash, losing my identity professionally, which ended up turning out to be a blessing because now I get to do what I truly love, and that is to pontificate on my perceptions on dating, mating, or relating. And so I was fortunate. I had a therapist, a built-in therapist. Now, it was her choice to choose me. And I think, and by the way, we are still friendly to one another. She's in an amazing relationship with a man now that she's been living with for six years. So I, I'm, I'm very happy for her. But I'm telling you, I wasn't in a good place. And so many of you know about the most significant relationship I had. And it ended about six months ago, six, seven months ago. Many of you watched my journey. I shot videos with her. I was deeply in love. I was all in. But I would be lying to you if I didn't say that while she and I did what was known as a conscious uncoupling, and if you haven't read the book by uh, Catherine Woodward Thomas, I highly recommend reading the book Conscious Uncoupling. There's a link below. The reason why I'm bringing up is I actually opened up one of the chapters today and I want to read to you the chapter heading because I recognized, and the chapter heading is Break the Pattern, Heal Your Heart. I recognize that in my own life, I have walls up. I have walls up. That There was deep, there, there was like, it was the death not just the death of the relationship, the death of the dream. I thought I was going to go the distance with this person. And, and I share this with you because I'm blessed enough. I have a coach I'm processing this with. I recently was processing this with a friend the other night. I was really processing a lot of the emotional pain and what caused me to even doubt my own capacity to be in a relationship. And I would be lying if I didn't say I have some walls up. 
because it to be vulnerable to be so vulnerable with an makes me cry to be so vulnerable with another human being and and while I, I'm this is a metaphor that isn't accurate it feels like the 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 plank was pulled out from underneath me and that's a that's a dramatic exaggeration and yet on an emotional level the little kid inside of me that's what it feels like I think it's important to heal from our past relationships. I mean thoroughly and as completely as we can possibly heal so that we don't take this residue into any future relationship, which makes it difficult for anyone to like you, let alone love you in the future. And I'm just addressing this in this video because I think it's critically important to understand what might be happening in the dating marketplace today, particularly for those of us in midlife. Now, for those of us in midlife, you know, it's interesting. I had a comment come in on um, uh, my group page the other day. And if you're not familiar, I have a group called Midlife Love Mastery. There's a link below this, uh, to join the group. This is a group where you can have direct access to me on a regular basis. But we were talking about, you know, the challenge of getting a second date, the challenge of wanting a second date with someone and the challenge of getting a second date with someone. Isn't it fascinating? You know, we, we all believe that this should just be so simple. Just mating should be so ridiculously simple. Well, I want you to think back hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, it was simple. When we lived in tribes and there was 150 people, and let's just say there were 50 people of a certain age that were, um, you know, usually the younger demographic that were suitable for one another, half men, half women. That's it. That's, how you, that's all you had to choose from. And it was right in front of you. Now everybody to choose from is behind a screen, is behind a screen. Isn't it fascinating? Everybody we choose from, most everyone we meet today is behind a screen. We don't know who they are. And so it makes it very challenging to decide whom we should date. In fact, I did a post on Instagram today and I want to read it with everyone. Some people seek a serious committed relationship and others say they want a serious relationship one but cannot commit for various reasons, kind of like what I just talked about. For those who seek a serious relationship, it takes almost being a detective to pick up on the subtle clues, AKA red flags, most humans give off in their capacity or willingness to partake in a serious relationship. Most people miss these clues because lust, limerence, or chemistry was, des was designed to bond us on a cellular level, but it doesn't mean they, they suit us on a relationship level. While this attachment was meant to help us procreate the species, relationships today require a different approach before attraction and romance, and that is vetting. Asking a few critical questions before jumping, into, jumping in on the romance bandwagon puts the odds in one's favor when choosing someone aligned with a person's values, visions, lifestyle, emotional maturity, and relationship skills. Sadly speaking, most humans are afraid to go deep because there's, there's a lot of jackass advice to discourage interviewing someone. And I say bunk, interrogate people is my motto. Who here agrees? And the meme that goes with it, if you wanna see it, it says attraction and romance-based dating keep individuals in the honeymoon phase, which bypasses the vetting stage. By the way, there's a link right here to schedule a discovery call with me to see if working with a coach is right for you. My whole coaching practice is designed to address the vetting, to address the vetting. Vetting mean ask better questions before you go on a date. So if you apply, my approach by before you ever go on a date with someone, you ask those critically important questions. There's basically one thing you need to address on the first date. And that is what I'm about to share with you right now. And that is being safe, safe, S-A-F-E, S-A-F-E. This is what I want you to identify before even considering. This is after a first date. 
to consider a second date. And what the SAFE stands for, the S is, do you have a spark with this person? Do you have a spark? It's not just about attraction, okay? It's do you feel something, like, uh, let me just say this, you could be with the most beautiful man or woman in the room and feel no spark, and you could be with a person that probably isn't your type and you can feel a tremendous amount of spark. If you feel spark, it's worth a second date. The A stands for all right. All right. Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel open? Do you feel receptive? Do you feel all right being with this person? That's a great sign. If you're feeling comfortable, if you're feeling open, if you're feeling receptive, hence the word safe, you feel safe. If you feel all right, then it's worth maybe considering a second date with a person. The F stands for fun. Are the two of you enjoying yourselves? Are you enjoying yourselves? And the E stands for enthusiasm. Can you say yes to a second date with a bit of enthusiasm? I'm here to say you should feel like you really want to see this person. Do you feel safe? A spark, all right, fun, and enthusiasm. If you're feeling those, then it's probably worth giving this person a chance. However, as I said prior to this, do your vetting a bit of those critically important questions before you go on the date so you can then see if it makes sense to move forward with this person. Because then, is this making sense? Is this resonating with you? Please let me know. If it is, please hit that like button. <laughs> please uh, share this video with your friends, okay? And please post a comment as well if this is resonating with you. All right, now we're going to talk about fun ways men show they like you. Okay, without saying it, it's the reason why I teed it up this whole conversation the way I did is because I think we ambivalently go into the dating practice. So I'm just here to offer humans to be more intentional about the process, be more cognizant, be more aware, do your due diligence. Dating is a discernment tool to decide if this person is worth actually investing more of your heart. Okay. So, funny ways men show they like you. The first funny way is sarcastic humor, sarcastic humor. You know, when sarcasm is oftentimes hides pain or fear. And when we like someone, we can oftentimes be in a state of fear. So we can use sarcasm as a way to believe that we are actually connecting at some level with this person, and yet it almost always backfires. And I am so guilty of this, folks. I have sometimes in the early stages of communicating with someone, you know, uh, on the dating apps, I have said something sarcastic only for it to land poorly. And it was really, it was actually, I was trying to show that I like this person, but it backfires on me. I believe this is a way men show, some, sometimes men show this way of showing that they like you. However, it's a reflection of, um, you know, their inability to read the room. And I am guilty of this. We think, we, we humans believe that sarcasm actually is our friendly way of connecting with another human being. And yet it oftentimes backfires. Have you ever experienced that where a guy was sarcastic? Oh my God, this one woman, I said, well, you better look like your pictures. I hope you're not fat. Oh my God, I said that before a date and that triggered her big time. I was just being sarcastic. I had no idea it took us down a rabbit hole of how that triggered her own pain. But it was because I liked her. I was trying to demonstrate that I liked her. So that's one of the funny ways men show they like you. Number two, they overshare. When men are nervous, they oftentimes overshare. Now, this is tricky because, as I said earlier, we are swimming in a sea of a lot of emotional dysfunctionality with men and women, particularly in their traumas from their past relationships. And so sometimes when they're nervous, they overshare about their past relationship. And that actually could be a clue that they're not capable of any serious relationship. So in some level, if somebody is oversharing, you have to become that detective. You have to listen very closely to determine, is this person truly healed from their past relationship? 
Like I said before, we are swimming in a sea of dysfunctionality. The biggest dysfunctionality for most humans is that they're still in pain and they haven't healed from their past relationship. And when a person overshares, it might be a sign that they like you, but it might also be a sign that they're not ready for a significant relationship. Number three, being overly romantic. Okay, folks, I gotta, I'm, I'm gonna embarrass myself here for a moment. I remember the first date with that one woman I shared earlier in the video, how uh, the therapist I was in relationship with. I wrote her a poem for our first date. I wrote a poem. It's because I liked her. It was corny. Um, I actually got the idea. Does anyone remember the, the bachelorette, Trista? Um, the man she married, Ryan, was a, uh, a fireman, but also a poet. And I remembered, like, after watching that series, that episode 20 years ago, I just started, I had already, I had written poetry before, you know, more like uh, roses are red, violets are blue, your, uh, your eyes are beautiful, and so are you, kind of thing. I mean, that was cheesy. I just made that up on the fly. But uh, I would write poems like that. And I wrote a poem because I like someone. I was overly romantic. Now, they will, the, the rules say men who act that way are very needy. They're very needy. Yeah. But you know what? Needy guys actually make better boyfriends. They need you. You know, believe it or not, I know it's completely unattractive, but needy guys are better than the avoidant guys. You know, they're better than the... See, it's in... isn't it fascinating? Women are most attracted to asshole men who treat them like shit. And the nice guys who are overly romantic and needy, they reject. And yet those are the men who probably make better boyfriends. And so this just shows you, it just shows you how, um, how dysfunctional we humans operate in the dating realm. And last but not least, short text messages. Okay. When I like someone, sometimes I just give short text message. My favorite one is called TOY, T-O-Y. And it simply says, thinking of you. Oftentimes we don't know what to say in text message. So sometimes it's just one word, one phrase, one sentence, because we don't know what to say. Many of us are tongue tied when it comes to our capacity to express to, to uh, another human being. So when you get those short text messages, it might mean, might mean, he just doesn't know what to say. It doesn't mean he doesn't care. It just means he doesn't know what to say. And these are some funny ways men show they like you without saying it. And I'm not suggesting that these are great ways to show it. It just happens to be a few ways men show they like you without saying it. Hey, listen, I hope you found value in this content today. If you did, post a comment below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on what I shared in these, these three particular areas. As always, if you find value in my content, please hit that like button, please share this video, please subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell as well so you can be notified of new videos. And also, if you'd like to connect with me, there's a link right here to schedule a discovery call with me in the, in the show notes. You can join my group called Midlife Love Mastery. You can follow me on Instagram. You can get the books I recommend. By the way, don't forget to get my book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? A Journey of Personal Development, Self-Help and Spiritual Work, a link below and also to get my dating vows listed below as well.